I think we're wishing we would have planned like a two-day retreat uh, for as much as there is to um, to talk about and, and share um, regarding um, your experiences with um, opioid use disorder. Unfortunately, we have a, you know about uh, 40 minutes left, and what what we really want to focus in on is how can we make medical treatments and um, um, better um, and 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 have them have the end have them achieve you heard it early this morning Electra talked about endpoints and what that means is a drug has to show that it can have benefit for you and it has to show it in a very concrete specific way you have to be able to say I know this drug shows benefit in people and so what our job is is to translate the things that you're really caring about into those concrete things that can be measured at the end of the day, such as, as we were talking, um, the, the woman in the, um, in the shirt about, uh, about um, reducing use. And so we want to get into more of those aspects. What does this look like? Okay. So I first um, want to um, I first, I'm just doing a little bit of real-time math here. It's it's so hard when you have 200 people looking at you doing math. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, let's let's skip the next polling question and go on to the to the third. The, the polling question we're going to skip was about the downsides of treatment, and I think you've been very clear in the downsides. Do you have something you you'd like to? Okay, we'll let you go, and then I'll go with the um, with the polling question. Okay. Hello, my name is Stephen. Once again, I'm here with the Man Alive program, and what worked for me was um, I've been on the program for nine years, and what worked for me was the methadone as well. But today is I can say that it's my first year of actually being clean. Okay. Okay. Now, with, the, with, the, with saying that... And by that, you <clears throat> just mean that you are not using... Nothing at all, those. right. Well, within saying that, the, the time it took so long for me to get to this year was that I needed mental health mm -hmm. to help me realize and to come out of denial about being on drugs and other things such as um, abuse coming up and everything that goes into mental health. I believe that if it was more mental health mm -hmm. accessibility in programs, it would help out a lot. Okay. So I, I want to I want to claps or show of hands if you agree with what um, you just said. Okay. And I think yes. So I okay. All of the FDA people are clapping too. I think we I think we um, I think that is has been made crystal clear, um, and and I think that it's well understood the need for the, who set it up here so nicely? The three things that are needed together, the, the supports, the counseling, the, the medical treatments, if that's necessary. And what we want to do moving forward is, um, let me do a show of hands. How many of you believe that medical treatments is a necessary part of your OUD? Even if you don't use them now, it might be a necessary part of your OUD to manage your condition. I think medical I think medical treatment in terms of a type of medicine that you would get from your doctor. Yes, yeah, so the traditional medication assisted therapies. Yeah. Okay, so how raise your hand if you believe that that medic, medication assisted therapies as Sharon just described are part of you can see as being part of your management needs. Okay. Okay? Done a show of hands of those who who, who do not. Okay, so we do have some, but we're going to go through now and we're going to assume that, that someday there will be newly, the FDA will be able to approve new medications to, um, to help you manage your OUD and all the ways we've been talking about it today. Okay, so can we go, um, can we go, we'll go on. Okay, one more. Mm-hmm. Keep going. 
Next polling question. Okay. So here's here's what we want to think about. Is what would what would any if you were even if it's in a, a, a a uh, currently approved drug and you could consider taking it of any treatment when considering a new treatment even one that's not yet even one that's not yet here okay, for opioid use disorder which of the following benefits would you consider to be most meaningful in your current life situation so one a sorry a help me control my use of opioids better so that I can function that was what we heard back at the table over there B, help me achieve complete abstinence of opioids. C, reduce effects of opioids withdrawal. D, reduce the effects of opioid cravings. E, reduce how often I have to take the treatment. B, allow me the ability to take my medication at home. Or G, some other benefit that's not up here. We're going to explore these benefits. So you can choose up to two things. Is anything unclear about the question? What's most important to you about a treatment? What will it do for you? Is there a question? Do you have a question? OK, we'll wait till we see the, the results. And on the web, um, please chime in. This is, this is, it's got a big highlight on my, on my sheet here. This is probably the most important question that that um, many of my colleagues want to hear. OK. Do some people need clickers and they don't have them? We will bring clickers to you. OK. OK, okay let's go to the um, results. OK, you've made our discussion difficult because you picked everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so uh, let's start with the most, the one that got the most in the room. And, and on the web, what results are we getting? Um, actually, quite different from on the web. We have about 73% saying reduce opioid cravings. Okay. Uh, and then about 40% Control use of opioids, 30% for complete abstinence, and reducing withdrawal, mm -hmm. and then less than 20 for the rest. Okay. Now, from here on out, I, I, w let's try not to speak about specific medications, because again, the, moving forward, we don't care about what medication it is. We just care about what you really are looking for out of a treatment. And we, I noted at the beginning that there are differing perspectives in here, and so we want to take both of these um, together, because hopefully someday there will be medications that meet whatever your needs are. Okay. Let's take here B because it was the most um, slightly more in the room. Help me achieve complete abstinence of, of opioids. First, let me, is there any clarification, um, any question from my FDA colleagues about a type of endpoint that you would like to um, ask about here? While they're thinking, I'll let, just, what is it, if it's different than what you have already, because we have to also recognize a lot of you here in the room are currently abstinent from, from opioids. So you might have to go back into your memories about when it was more difficult or think about potential for relapse. Okay. What would you want to get out of that? What would, ab, what would it, how would you describe what you're looking for there? We'll start with Amanda and then we'll go here. Think of it similar to when you're talking to a patient with chronic depression. And you're hitting some of the points. So you may have a medication that handles the cravings OK, but has some serious side effects that are similar to when you were in active use. Um, and understanding that we've found a couple of medications that work really well, but there needs to be a combination of things. And there also needs to be an understanding that if you have opioid use dependency or you have opioid depression, and you're treating that with a medication that's derived from opioids, the depression is still there. So it would be, it would be nice if there was a way to have a medication that 
would make our brains not crave the drug and also have something similar to that SSRI to help handle some of the anxiety, help handle some of the depression. Um, I think a good chunk of us in this room have experienced the benefits of trazodone because it does help us go to sleep in a, with a non-narcotic component and have that be something that's kind of prolonged so you can hit two birds with one stone. And, 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 and you're saying decrease the stigma. Yeah, okay. Okay, so back here we had, okay, yes. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> Sharon again. My uh, question is, does, uh, is there any research into medications that are not opiate-based for withdrawal? <laughs> because to me it's like, somewhat like exchanging one okay. opiate addiction for another. Mm -hmm. So I'll let, I'll let see if Sharon wants to answer the question. So I have a couple of comments on that. I, I, I just heard two comments about replacing one opioid with another, and I'd like us to follow up on seeing how much people really believe that being on um, medication-assisted therapy with something like methadone or buprenorphine is simply replacing one drug with another, versus is it an active treatment for a condition. But in terms of what's available to manage withdrawal, we recently had an advisory committee meeting, so I can tell you about this because it's public, for a drug that was in, um, being developed to help reduce the symptoms associated with a fairly rapid detox. Now, the pros and cons of rapid detox and what was going to happen next were not the question. But so there is a drug that is under review to help reduce those symptoms. One of the questions that came up during the committee was about longer term, slower detox, and that's an outstanding question. So there is some research in there. Um, but that's what I can speak about in terms of what's been made public. So let me just do a show of hands to Sharon's, Sharon's question about, let me frame it as a goal. How many of you would as a goal for those of you that are currently on one of those products that we've been talking about, or you, your goal is to not be on it. Okay. How many of you, show your hand, would be willing to take a medication for up to the remainder of your life um, to, to address your OUD? Show of hands. You had, if you have to take a medic, you, so maybe it's not the medications that we're talking about, the ones that you think are, might be replacing one for the other, but it was some other medication. Are you willing to take a medic, so it's not the fact that you're not willing to take a medication for the rest of your life. Are you, show of hands if you'd be willing to take a medication. Okay, that, we're getting a lot of head nods, that, that yes, you'd be willing to take a medication. Now, how many of you would rather it, your goal is to be able to get off one of the treatments that we've been talking about? You're willing to take some other medication for the rest of your life, but maybe you'd prefer to not be on this one. Okay, so we're not going to discuss that, but we do note that that is then a perspective um, that's out there. You can make one comment. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's let um, Blake come to A brief one? Uh, that's it. Okay. Super brief. Um, just with regards to that, uh, um, how the, uh, if, if, being on something like buprenorphine is replacing one substance for another or one drug for another. Uh, I guess technically it is, but I feel like um, Suboxone, for whatever reason, uh, because of it's chemically designed to do so, it allows you to re-enter society and become a functioning part of society again. And I think that that's essential uh, with regards to maintaining a... a basically in, in recovery, that's essential. So if that requires you to stay on it for the rest of your life, in my opinion, I think that that's better than any alternative. And obviously, I think it's probably extra to get off the, the buprenorphine. That's like an extra step, right? So if you want to attain that, I guess, quote unquote, higher level, I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, you know, I don't think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's best to stay on that. Okay. okay. So then you're, so you're adding, so again, uh, this is a very complicated issue because um, you're adding then to say that 
that if you need it, you need it, right? And so that's that's what it's, it sounds like we're hearing from a lot of you in the room. Okay, I'm going to take a maybe what might be a couple other perspectives, just a few of you, and then we're going to move on and, and talk. Um, okay, go ahead. Um, let's see. The, the woman back. I just I'm struck by the way that we talk about this kind of treatment for substance use related problems. It's so different than every other kind of treatment that we talk about. So if you had problems with anxiety and you mm -hmm. went to see a therapist, they would say, you know, we have, you know, different options. We can give, you know, we have medication that we can give you. We can uh, do behavioral intervention and te you, teach you breathing techniques. We can do talk therapy and delve into your childhood trauma and see mm -hmm. where this came from. And some combination of that will probably be helpful to you. Um, but if they said, if you follow our treatment plan, you will never, ever be anxious again in your life, you would say, you are crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's ridiculous. But that's what we do with drug treatment is we say, you know, if you follow this plan, the goal is that this problem is going to be completely gone when, you know, the reality is, is that it's like most other things in life that they're, you know, sometimes you deal with it better and there are periods where it doesn't go as well. But we see it as this completely discrete other thing. And I think that's one of the big problems. Okay. Are, are you things. speaking of, abs of abstinence right now, that if you follow our plan, you won't use again? Or are right. you speaking so, of I mean, something so, I mean, you might have somebody, who, yes, you might have somebody who, in fact, is able to never, ever have another episode of anxiety in their life, but that's highly unlikely okay. that, you, that for most people, it's, a, you know, a treatment plan for dealing with anxiety disorder, you know, usually looks like, you know, client will reduce number of panic attacks per week will learn strategies for coping with feelings of anxiety and a typical treatment plan for uh, substance use disorder, is, you know, having seen many of them in my life, is something like, you know, client will refrain from any illegal drug use. Client will not relapse to illegal drug use. Okay. So give me another one. Give me an, what, what do you want to, give me something you'll say, client, uh, individual well, so, will, it will what? So give me we'll, another. Give give us an alternative, and then I think we can work with that. Yeah. Well, I, well, I, I mean, I think people have said this. What you know? What can I? I mean, I work for a syringe exchange program, and when I look at the data that mm -hmm. we've had in terms of what you know, what drugs people use, and people who say that they use Suboxone, over half of the people who report that they use Suboxone say they use it sometimes, not okay. daily. So obviously, it's something that's helpful to people but not necessarily exclusive to the exclusion of other drugs. And I mean, I know there's been research that shows that, that people who use illegal drugs but also use Suboxone do better than people who don't use Suboxone and use illegal drugs. So, so I think, you know, as for everybody, you know, people want to have some control over the unpleasant symptoms in their yeah. life, which are various and they're different for different people. And so I think looking at that, piece of it that, you know, if if I, uh, I think about, um, you know, uh, what I've read about naltrexone use, occasional naltrexone use for alcohol, that people who say, when I want to drink, I take naltrexone and I don't drink as much, and that works for me, that that, that if there are ways that, that I mean, the, the mm -hmm. end point, the goal in all of the discussion has been, you know, zero, you know, not using any any of a certain kind of drug. And if you back that up and, you know, look at like we use, mo you know, most other behaviors that the goal mm -hmm. is how to do, you know, how to be able to manage things yourself so that you function in the way you want okay. to better. So let's, let's, um, let's then transition to A, to help me control my use of opioids. <clears throat> Careful. Help me control my use of opioids so that I can better uh, function. I think that's one area you're going into. Um, what is it? I'm going to throw out an example that's probably wrong. Okay, so you can correct me and then give me a better one. But to say that I have my family visiting for the next two weeks, and I would be able to not use or cut down or something like that while they're here, and I fully plan on using again to some higher level. 
after my family's gone. Okay, that's probably the wrong example, so you can tell me that and then tell me something better. Anyone, anyone? So we'll go there, we'll, Amanda first, and then while you're thinking, we'll go to uh, I totally did that. <laughs> we, <laughs> you, you have these functions, you, you need to appear normal. So you think about setting yourself up. Um, that was normally when I would pay more money for prescription medication because I would need it in such a high quantity to equal the kind, my tolerance that I had gotten at that point on heroin. Um, that would be kind of the land also where I would think about going out and grabbing Suboxone as well. Because um, that I could do that for a short period of time um, and then taper myself back on to whatever I was using. That was what it was for. Yeah. And back there. So I was just thinking like I'm going to work all week long. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the weekend, because I'm an adult, I'm going to do what m most Americans do, which is have a drink, or if that's not so what I do, I'm going to use opiates. So that would be sort okay. of the way I see this. So control it for some some period of the... Now, what would, can I ask, well, for, for, what would it take to do that? So how what would it take for you to be able to control it during the week Right. Um, and allow you to then use more and then be able to control it again. Can you think of, would it have to reduce your cravings during the week or would it have to affect your withdrawal during the week? Right, so it would have, it would have to affect a lot of things, but it would certainly have to affect withdrawal. It would affect, you know, anxiety, depression, you know, maybe obsessive thinking. Okay. That's sort of the, the best... You, Sort of a negative, uh, sort of a negative, negative uh, self-talk kind of, kind of uh, dialogue. So it would have to affect all of that. So let me ask another, another one. I'm going to throw out again, probably the, the wrong example, but you can correct me. Um, imagine you have gotten yourself to a point where you don't like how much you're using, but you don't want to. You want to go down, oh, across the board. You want to go down a bit. Talk about that. Is that a realistic type of endpoint? You'd like you'd be able to cut it in half because it's getting, you're doing dangerous amounts, or you're worried about um, overdose or or other risky behaviors. Okay, go ahead. We'll let you answer. Or I think people do that all the time with either through kratom, marijuana, meth use, like cocaine. People use in a way that. Um, makes it so you maintain your own self. And the reality is people don't go to methadone or Suboxone because we've decided to put so many barriers in their way to make it so hard to engage those systems that like legal, like I live in Washington, and so legalized marijuana has been more of a treatment, seems to be for opiate users, even though it's not scientific or anything like that. And like, for example, Kratom, people will use Kratom during the week and then they'll shoot heroin in the weekends. And so all of these things that people are using because the medical field has been locked out because we've decided to make it too hard to get these medications. So let me let, keep that, let, keep the microphone. Let me ask you, so again, we don't want to talk about specific treatments and I, and, um, and not all treatments can become FDA approved. What would, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what is it, what is it, do, how is it helping people? What would you want it to see to say, I'm, I'm at a level that's too high for me. I'm going to, I want just to cut back. Tell me in concrete terms what that, what that would do for you. Does it take a little edge off? Does it reduce your, your cravings but so that you don't crave? Uh, I can give much? you an example okay. yeah, um, right. through methamphetamine. So we, I run a needle exchange and we gave out meth pipes. And, the vet, and a huge portion of meth injectors switched to meth smoking. And the number one thing they said is now they can make their appointments now they can make their uh, doctors, they can see their family, they can do all these things while still using, um, and all they did was change the mode of how they ingest um, the drug and not change anything around what drug they're using. So if I can make a parallel, so maybe it's changing to safer forms or um, less um, potent forms. I'm, I'm making something up. Okay, so those are the... 
Those are the types of, of outcomes. So I think we're going to move on from. Um, okay, go ahead. Yes, please. I just wanted to say well, back when I first started using methadone, it was like maybe it come to that point where it's though, like if you use all week, right? I was wishing that it was a methadone program where you could just go on a weekend, like. Like you say, you want to get through a certain stage. Maybe you go, and it will hold you for that weekend or something. Then you wouldn't have to use it every day where it becomes dependent on methanol. You see, that was, to me, a good solution in the beginning. But like you say, you got to go through either you're in all the way or you're not in at all. Okay. Thank you for that. I want to move on to craving. Because we talked about what craving means, and, and what struck me was how craving can still affect, um, can still be a problem, even if you've been in recovery for a long time. So tell me about that. What does it, what could a medication do that could help? I'm, okay, I'm going to give, again, the wrong example, but imagine that you are worried about relapsing. That's maybe a big concern you have. And something that could help you um, get through periods of, you know that there's going to be some high, high anxiety or stress. That, or maybe you're going to be in a situation where you're going back to a type of situation that you might have used before in that type of situation. If, if something could help with the, this idea of cravings, however you think of it, what would that do? Would it take the edge off? Would it, you know... How could it help you cope through those situations that can be very challenging? Anyone? Does that question make sense? Okay, go over there, and then we'll come over here. Hi, it's Kevin again. So I, I uh, relapsed a year and a half ago after almost six years of sustained abstinence and recovery, um, and I am 12 years, 12 days since arresting that relapse. So um, <clears throat> basically, the position that I found myself in was a highly traumatic life event happened mm -hmm. at a period where I had no support structure around me. I had abandoned everything that had worked thus far. So the one example that I was personally affected by was a death of a loved one. My father passed away. and. Even though my family knew I was in recovery, I didn't tell them that I was, you know, all, all of a sudden in a highly vulnerable state. Yeah. So perhaps we as a society might recognize that if I had, I, I, and I had had relationships with a therapist, my primary care physician, they know my condition, uh, they knew about my father's passing, but nobody really asked me, uh, what's your craving level right now? Do you want to go out and go get high? And most people would assume, you know, that that might happen. The other example I'll give um, is not my personal example, but it's been echoed a lot of concern about people going in for medical treatments, surgery. Um, if I have to go to surgery and I'm going to be in a lot of pain, I'm asking for opiates. I don't care. Opiates work very well at, at mitigating pain. And if I'm under the care of a doctor, I can trust those around me that I can get through that without relapsing. Um, however, the current state of affairs today is a very similar situation. I read a report in Stat News um, by uh, Seth Mnuchin, not Seth Mnuchin, Seth Mnuchin, uh, who went to Mass General Hospital to receive surgery for uh, kidney stones. And even though his PCP knew he was 20 years in recovery from injection drug use, his wife knew, no doctor at any point ever gave him a consultation about the take-home pills that they, they were handing him. And all of a sudden, he found himself physically dependent two weeks later not having had experienced that in decades. So we need uh, to recognize these highly vulnerable states that people with opiate use disorders will encounter in their life. And they need to be given the proper outreach and support mm -hmm. throughout those decisions, whatever they make. So think about FDA's role. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going so off script. I'm sorry. We'll see. Think, uh, can medications help with that? So I'm think, So what comes to mind is the idea of the rescue. Um, but so you... you and we've all acknowledged the need for support, but would you want a medication that could help you ha help get through that traumatic lifetime that could reduce your risk of, of 
of going back, of, of relapsing, of using again? Okay, so right here we have Jan. Oh. Sure, so yeah, that was my experience. I was having a very difficult time after having a traumatic brain injury um, and wanting to make sure that I didn't start using opiates again. And so that's why I took naltrexone. Um, the other thing is after having a surgery, um, I do have a really wise doctor who knows my condition. And so I went in and had detox um, and, and was inpatient in residence while I needed to do that so that I didn't just get put back out on the street. And I, I have a really tight opioid use plan and so it includes all of those things. I mean, recovery planning is, a, for me, a part of my recovery supports and makes a difference. And it does allow me to be in control even when I'm not in control. So it's like a, what do you call it, a, a medical advanced directive. So I made my plan when I was in a really good place. And so when I'm taking a medication that doesn't allow me to make decisions for myself, I have people who are allowed to step in and make decisions for me at that time. Uh, so, yes, right. Yeah, I think that um, having some type of intervention, I, I'm not sure that I agree with the notion that all FDA can do is produce medications. No, I'm just thinking of one role that I, we do. Yeah, I do think you have other authorities that you could use to help in this area. But that being said, I think some type of intervention to help manage stressful situations. Um, maybe they're drug related and maybe it can be devices and apps and, and okay. other things. Um, I, I think that I am very visual and when I see products that I was formerly addicted to, it can set off and trigger cravings. Um, and I think it's important that these cravings are for more than things other than just opioids. And that um, drug development or device or app development that can target that reward system in the brain. And I'll give you an example about physical craving. Uh, with ten years with ten years in recovery, uh, when I put my ATM my credit card in an ATM because I used to use all night and would go to the ATMs and maybe there was money in there and maybe there wasn't for many, 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 many years. I was a working mm -hmm. person, so I was lucky, but you'd run out, yes. obviously. Mm -hmm. And my stomach, after even 10 years in recovery, would still flip. When I was at that ATM machine, I would get that, there's that 20 seconds before you mm -hmm. know whether cash is coming back out or not and your card is coming back out. And I would still feel physical sickness about that longing and that craving after 10 years. So don't think that physical craving isn't a problem. And I can get that where I can get the taste of alcohol when I'm, I'm in my job. There's a lot around. And I can actually get the taste of it mm -hmm. when I'm stressed and seeing it everywhere. Um, so things that could address that that are really brain oriented, okay. I think, or gut oriented or heart, I don't know, but would you some organ. A so if this, I don't, not to say that it rises to the level of, of a challenge. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Go I, ahead. I do have a follow up on that because uh, yeah. in particular, uh, many people are interested in this concept of craving. If there was some type of medication that could um, prevent you from feeling that experience, is that something you would find helpful all by itself? It wouldn't necessarily change anything about the way you use drugs or, or any other aspect, but just that one symptom, yeah. would, that Absolutely. would be beneficial? I would take it, yeah. For me, and I, this is not the way it is for everyone, if it's mood altering, it tends to trigger me wanting more mood altering medication. If it's simply cured cravings, I'd be first in line because I still, with 20 years, have problems with various kinds of cravings. Uh, hand raises if, if you agree with this perspective. Okay. So we'll come right here. Um, can, can I? I yes, of course. Of course, Julia. So uh, that's a very interesting perspective from someone in long-term recovery who still struggles with those very unpleasant experiences of craving. Suppose someone who's in an early phase trying to get control of their drug use um, 
had a medication that made them experience the cravings less intensely, but didn't that didn't translate into any modification of how much they use medications. Would people in early recovery or people actively using and looking to gain control, would they find that helpful? Just this is part of like. It might have to be for the doctor. I think we have right. a lot of people in yeah. sort of long-term okay. recovery. But if you're on the web, please do. And um, and and if and on the docket, come then. Unless anyone someone wants to talk about that, you you want to address this question? Okay. Do you want to address this question? Uh, in a general yes. sense, yes. Okay. We'll let so, you go first, and then we'll go back. Yeah. My name is Richard Chisholm. I'm a professional documentary filmmaker from Baltimore, and my wife Margaret Chisholm is an associate professor in psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She's an addiction certified researcher and educator. Today she's taking care of patients and I uh, will be representing excerpts from her written comments on behalf of our family. We are the parents of a 25 year old son with opioid use disorder. My wife heard about this meeting from her colleagues and decided to comment because she cares as a mother and an addiction professional. I'm here at my own time and expense because uh, I see what Kratom has meant to our son and to our family and, uh, and hope that he and others will have uh, access to this drug, which we came across uh, in the last year uh, because of his use of it. So her statement, and I'm going to read her statement. She How says- we, uh, we only have a few more minutes left. Um, yeah. Is it something, can we do an uh, open public comment? I, I just arrived here. I'm sorry if I'm not in the right place at the okay. right time. No, no, that's fine. If you could just keep I'll it brief. I'll consolidate it. Yep. So he's been struggling with the opioid use disorder for the last four or five uh -huh. years, in and out of college, in and out of treatment. Uh, he was on buprenorphine for uh, two and a half years, and he was unable to work and lethargic during that time. And so we've been through the mill, as many people, many, many families have. And uh, after he was uh, a few relapses, and after he was living in Seattle in a sober living uh, facility, um, he started using Kratom. I guess he heard about it. Uh, he was sober, he was going to meetings, and he started smoking Kratom. Uh, to stave off his cravings. And uh, because the living facility uh, tested for Kratom and kicked him out, he was almost homeless briefly, and then he decided to go back to college. He now smokes uh, Kratom occasionally as a maintenance okay. for the craving. He has a girlfriend. He's back in college. He just visited us, and he's in better shape than he's ever been. Okay. And so as a family, we're concerned about Kratom becoming inaccessible to people like him because it's been sort of a it's not a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. It's been a very, very uh, uh, efficacious way for him okay. to survive. We want to hear all experiences about, we welcome experiences about all products and p especially through the docket or through the, the webcast. Um, and so thank you for sharing your experiences. We won't be able to get into that discussion in, in any depth. Um, there was one more answer about the qu on the question that um, Celia posed about so reducing I, craving. I think we need to think of drug use a little differently. I think we need to think of chaotic drug use and stable drug use. And how can we get as many chaotic drug users into stable drug users? Because I think the concept of recovery, that can be their form of recovery. And I also think that if we can get more people into stable use, okay. then we can start engaging them in a myriad of other health-related issues. Um, and, and I think that's how we really need to see this. Okay. And I think we have a lot of people in recovery here, and I, so it's been very re, re, kind of recovery-focused. Um, but I think it's really important that we like really get in depth of defining chaotic use compared to stable drug use and how we can support people in stable drug use okay. and how we Great. can get as many chaotic drug users into stable drug use. Okay. We aren't going to be able to follow up that now, but you promised to send in a docket comment. Define... Sarah? Chronic stable drug use and and um, chaotic, and what and what it means. Go ahead, Sharon. So I would just like to ask. This is really interesting for us, and I would like to encourage people as much as possible to send in comments to the docket so we can hear as much about that as possible. But that's I think very important. Thank you. Okay, we. Are I'd like to ask one more question yes. too. Um, you all mentioned that some of you are uh, reluctant to want to use medication. I'm just curious as to whether anyone in the audience has used a device or an app to help manage their condition. Okay, for, let's spill it out. An app, some sort of app. Okay, another kind of device. Okay, let's just get a. Can we get a quick, um, just what, just quick what what it was? Yeah, I use the Calm and Headspace meditation app to chill out 
anxiety and help manage stressful situations. And I've used a device that monitors my sleep because lack of sleep makes me start craving and basically just be off. Anyone else device? Stay right here. Okay. Um, I've used the Spire device, and so it's um, it monitors your heart rate variability and can identify when you're having anxiety attacks. One more, and then we'll go to Amanda. I use the device. Um, for uh, since I was an orthopedic um, client, two hip replacements, I, um, I would I would have um, purchased uh, through my doctor uh, what they call a tens unit, and it's an alternate for pain control without taking anything by mouth or any other way, and I use it temporarily. Finally, Amanda. Um the alpha stem. Okay. So I've already begged and borrowed from the people who are doing closing <laughs> remarks to go a few minutes longer. Um, we'll go to uh, 325. Again, we, I mean, we wish this was, we had more time. It's, it's really important. Um, a summary on the, on the webcast. And we can take one phone caller. And the phone caller, if, if you're in line for the phone and you, what we've, You've heard your issue discussed. We're going to please have a um, let someone else who has a, a, a new issue. Go ahead. Phone now. Uh, yeah, and webcast summary. Um, so uh, on the webcast, a lot of people talking about um, some of the issues that they've run into seeking treatment for themselves, uh, that addiction doesn't show up on a list of topics when they talk to some of their medical professionals, um, that when they're looking at what they would want in the treatment, that it's not necessarily just managing symptoms, um, like one at a time, like things like craving, that they'd like a more comprehensive solution, um, other similar sorts of comments like that. All right. Before we go to the phone, Mitra wants to um, ask a follow-up question. So this is what we were discussing before we went to lunch. I noticed in one of the pollings, uh, the majority of people said they're not concerned for opioid overdose or relapse. Can you just briefly talk about why you're not concerned for an opioid overdose? We're seeing an epidemic of it uh, all across the nation. And what are you doing? I mean, is there something, and I don't want to put any, um, my comments, uh, put uh, my ideas into your discussion, but what are you doing that you're not concerned? First, let's, let's get a show of hands. How, um, I know it's a tough question. How many of you are concerned about relapse and overdose in, in your situation? You are concerned. OK. And how many of you are, for whatever reason, you are not concerned about that? OK, so we do have some varying perspectives. Let's hear a couple comments to answer Mitra's question, and then we'll um, move Again, on to the phone. Sharon, uh, I'm not concerned about overdose. Because having used drugs as far back as I have, I know there are no, there's no heroin. And I know that what they're selling out here today is everything but. So that's what really got me on a, a drug withdrawal program. So I don't have any desire to try what they're selling today. So that's what keeps me away. Okay, one more, one more back there in the red. I disagree with her because um, what they're giving out today, that's what people is old in from. So there's no such thing as, as non-concern for overdose. Mm -hmm. We've had more overdose with this thing here yeah. that's out than we had when the real harm was out. Can and I, we just got a training the other day from these guys right here with the, the North Lane thing that go up the nose. We just had a training for that. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as no, no overdose. Um, we're not caring about it. Can I, I ask mean, a, a I follow mean, up? I mean, I'm, I might be saying it wrong, but I want to say that yeah. overdose academic is really out here today. What they're using today, you owe them more from that than you did with the real stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you know, very much. Now, Thank you very much. No Can I have a show of hand questions? How many of you who, who expressed some concern about possible relapse and, um, and then overdose associated? Are you carrying um, um, naloxone, Narcan? Are you carrying it on you now? Okay. 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 One. One. Okay. Thank you yeah. for demonstrating. We, okay. Uh, Final we, uh, comment. Then we're going to the phone. 
we are be more power. We are very concerned. We do not can train in, in and out the inner city. And what we do, we meet people on their own terms, wherever they at, whether they're using or not. We just want you to practice harm reduction. Mm -hmm. Do not isolate yourself. Do not let anybody take your self-esteem away where you're somewhere isolated in an old house using an overdose and no one's there to help you or save your life. Thank you. We okay. are very concerned and Great. we won't stop being okay. concerned. I am going to have to go to the phone. Um, so are there any callers on the phone? Uh, Operator, can we have a caller? Uh, Again, if we don't have it, it's, it's just important to allow our web cast participants to be able to, to chime in a, a little. But if we don't have any callers, that's fine. Stanley's line is open. OK, OK. Uh, we're going to ask you to keep it brief because um, we're, we're running really short on time, but your comment's important. OK, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. OK, great. Thanks for this forum to sit in on. My name's Stanley Poe. I live in Northwest Ohio, and I will make this brief. I'm a 62-year-old husband, father, grandfather, even a great-grandfather, and a longtime business owner. And until 30 days ago, I was addicted to opioid pain medication because of an initial 1987 spine surgery. Mm -hmm. I've had four surgeries since. And 30 days ago, literally 30 years on opioids, until 30 days ago, I was treated with ibogaine hydrochloride. Within six hours, it snapped. I've never had another craving, no dope sickness, nothing. Again, I'm not a 30-year-old junkie. I'm a 62-year-old yeah. man who's experienced this. And the FDA, I understand, you mentioned earlier, does not do what the pharmaceutical companies does, put money into research. But somebody mm -hmm. should because okay. this works. I had to travel out of the country to get this done. But Ibogaine saved my life. Great. Th thank you. And again, we want to hear all experiences with with everything that you think is helping you manage your op op um, opioid use disorder, please talk about that um, through the webcast um, as we close up or um, in the docket. We, we read all the docket comments. Okay, um, I sure will. I thank appreciate you. your thank time. You. But there is no more management. I don't have it anymore, thanks to Ibogaine. Okay, thank thank you. you. Okay. I know there are still hands raised, but if we don't, I'm, a, I'm worried about these buses that need to head back downtown or back to their places, and so we do need to move on. But you are showing that there is still more to the conversation to have. Again, we have the docket. Do we have, can we put up the web slide, site, um, the slide for, the, for the docket website? Um, this is, we've touched upon really important issues, and we really only got to the surface, and we know that. We knew that that's what we would get. Um, the conversation will continue, and I want to thank you all very much for your participation in the meeting today. I think we heard from almost everyone, and that is a real measure of success in our, in our book. Uh, can we give a round of applause for the courage and the forthcomingness you've had? Okay. So um, that's the end of the facilitated discussion. Again, there are evaluation forms. Please from that, we really want to know how we've, how we've done. We're going to move into the open public comment part. And so if you signed up for that, you will hear um, what, what we're going to move into there. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shannon Woodward. And right now, we're transitioning to the open public comment session of the meeting. So this part of the meeting allows an opportunity for people to comment on topics other than our two main discussion topics. This is also a chance for stakeholders other than individuals and families to speak. Keep in mind that FDA or NIDA will not address comments um, that we hear during this session, but all the comments are being transcribed and part of the public record. We'd like this to be a transparent process, so we encourage you to note any financial interest that may be relevant to your comment. This also may include things such as um, travel stipends as well. If you don't have any such interest, you may want to state that for the record, and if you prefer not to provide this information, you can still provide your comment. Um, so we collected signups when the meeting began. Right now we have 12 speakers signed up. I'm apologizing in advance if I butcher your name. Um, just correct me. I won't take any offense. 
And also, if I get to your name and you've shared during the meeting today and you um, feel that you don't need to provide a comment during this time, just let me know and I can um, accommodate you as well. The time for the comments is two minutes for each person. Um, we don't have a timer or a buzzer or anything like that. So um, as you get to the end of your time, I may just gently urge you and let you know. So first we have Jack Henningfield. Is Jack Henningfield still in the room? Okay. Did you say two minutes or ten minutes? <laughs> two, two. I'm Jack Henningfield. I provide consulting through Penny Associates on uh, addiction control medicines, pain medicines. I've worked on most of the addiction medicines since methadone. I think I'm proud of that. I think we've come a long way, but listening to people today, we have a lot further to go, and I hope you are listening to people today. One of my mentors was former Surgeon General Coop. He was dedicated to making addiction science, uh, advancing addiction science, and making treatments as easy as it is to get drugs. And we've come a long way, but not nearly far enough. I think he'd be happy with the opioid report from the White House and crush that it's not being implemented. So what we have is not available to a lot of people. Um, as you heard today, most people on opioids, it's not just an opioid problem. It's a broader mental health problem, it's a societal problem, and our treatments have to fit in the context of those problems. There is no one size fits all. We've got to address the needs that people have when they have them with treatments that are acceptable to them. And treatments that aren't acceptable or unaffordable are no good. I want to make a few comments on Kratom, which is used by three to five million Americans. And four surveys show that many people are using it as a lifeline away from opioids because it helps with their with withdrawal. I think that telling people that we're going to take it away is like telling somebody that's fallen into the ocean and struggling with life preservers that we're going to take your life preservers away because they're not Coast Guard approved. That doesn't make any sense. This is a lifeline. And finally, the four surveys show that many people who are using Kratom and their families are terrified that FDA and DEA may ban Kratom. What they would like in the survey show is for FDA to regulate Kratom, help ensure that what they buy is clean and pure and packaged properly. I'll be submitting longer uh, comments on the record, but I really appreciate what you've done, and I really appreciate uh, all the people that have come here today, families and people that have problems. This is an incredible eye-opener for people like me. I have family members with addiction, too, so I can relate to a lot of this at a very personal level. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, we have Richard Chisholm, but I know you just shared with us briefly. Um, next, we have Maureen Boyle. Maureen Boyle. Um, so I'm Maureen Boyle. I'm with the Addiction Policy Forum. And I just wanted to um, first thank FDA for doing this. It's incredibly important. Um, you know, both from the perspective of making sure that we facilitate the development of new medications and, and facilitate a, a larger investment in this, but, you know, I think it's also important to remember the message that the abstinence-only endpoints sends, right? That, you know, if you've managed to cut down by 75%, that, you know, if you use again, that that's not success, that's failure, right? So instead of celebrating the fact that you were able to stop for that long or cut down to that amount, you're telling people that, that they've failed. Um, and I think that sends a really important and really bad message to, to, to patients. And so getting to a place where, you know, other outcomes that are more meaningful to people um, are, are an acceptable endpoint is really important. Um, and I, you know, I come from this both as a scientist, as an advocate, but also as a family member. Um, so I have um, a sister who is in active addiction and has been for decades. Um, and I can tell you that my family does not care what she ingests. Like, we don't care what she's putting into her body. We care about whether she can take care of herself and whether she can hold a job, and whether she shows up. And you know, however she can get there, 
I think is is the important thing. And I think if we can look at things like I said, other than other than abstinence, and th you know, even if we're looking at like losing the diagnosis, right? Like you know, you talked about before how the diagnosis is made up of compulsion to use and social impacts and and physical withdrawal symptoms. So, but we're not looking at people who you know still use occasionally, or you know, still even you know, even if they don't want to, and even if they mess up occasionally, but you know, they've managed to reclaim their lives and, and we don't count that as success, that's insane. Thank you. Now we have Carol McDade. Hello. Uh, my name is Carol McDade and I wanted to um, just use this period for two issues. One, um, I came here today to advocate that there's no wrong door to recovery. And just because I have taken a particular path, uh, which ultimately was abstinence-based, wasn't always that way, but um, I kind of feel like that, that there, you're put in this box and that somehow if you choose to have abstinence-based recovery, then that means that you're anti-people who can manage effective drug use or that you're anti-science or you're anti-MAT. and. I think sometimes um, some of the agencies and others in the field put us in that box, those boxes and try to pit us against one another because it fits their various interests. And I know I am one of many thousands and tens and thousands of people who believe there is no wrong door to recovery and that people get to define their recovery the way that they want to. And um, there is no judgment from many of us. I know the bad actors or people who are loud on social media sometimes get to typecast all of us, but we're, we're good. This is just my pathway. It doesn't mean I judge people who have another pathway. And I think a lot of times, at least in policy circles in Washington, which I'm familiar with, somehow, you know, we've gotten shunned as that people who have abstinence space are bad actors that, that judge other people. And it's just, I've spent my life working to help people recover in any way that they can. The second thing I want to talk about was the use of taxpayer dollars to uh, help develop or uh, market or whatever um, uh, drug abuse deterrent formulations of, of medications. Um, I know at least in Congress, you know, a law passed that gives tax credits for the development of drug deterrent formulations. And my personal experience in working with a lot of people in or seeking recovery is that there is a recipe on the internet to beat every single drug abuse deterrent formulation. Um, there are um, people who are clever and smart uh, that have figured out a way to get around all of them and that continued funding for that, instead of putting it into any number of other things, whether it's naloxone or treatment or, or just education or safe syringe uh, injection sites, whatever, might be a better use of federal policy efforts than drug abuse deterrent formulations, which can be gotten around. Thank, Thank you, you, Carol. Um, next, we have Stephen Sun. Is Steven son? Hello, my name is Steven Sun. I'm a physician and vice president and head of quality risk management at Cineos Health. We're an international contract research organization that serves the biopharma company and also serves and also has a great interest in serving public health. Uh, thank you for seeking the input of public stakeholders as the development of um, products for opioid use disorder and as part of Cineos' health's commitment to the improvement of public health and a 2017 research collaboration agreement of a risk repository system with the FDA for providing a systematic risk assessment of a multi-stakeholder journey for opioid use disorder as a demonstration of the system's risk repository capability which we have deposited in the FDA docket for public read and share. The intent for such an analysis is to provide decision makers and governing industry an efficient platform for understanding complex issues that involve a multitude of stakeholders that could be achieved through the systematic mapping of each stakeholder's perspective. 
And in this case, for opioid use disorder, we acknowledge the numerous questions that are asked specifically from the patient's perspective, and we made an attempt to highlight the patient journey in the broader perspective and details of the stakeholder, as well as others associated with OUD. As a former medical officer of the US FDA, uh, CEDARS Division of Risk Management and Control Substances Staff, I experienced repeated challenges to access experts under short timelines for evaluating products as part of developing a comprehensive risk assessment. And from this need, a framework emerged to develop a continuous learning system so that each unique bolus of new information and lessons learned could be additive and compound to a growing and intelligent knowledge base. And we do believe many stakeholders lack the access to see each other's perspectives. So a multi-stakeholder risk assessment would be a cooperative solution to help support many stakeholders, including patients, providers, government, association, and industry, who are also likely developing from scratch very similar or overlapping risk assessments. We're also advancing this expansion to include an engineering-grade failure mode and effects analysis for common share. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Stephen. Now we have Kevin Franciato. Franciati. Hi, so um, I wanted to just bring up two points. Um, first, they're kind of preface. I thought I saw in the slide um, from one of the representatives from NIDA a quote about drug abuse being taking a substance that changes uh, mood or mind altering effects. And that struck me as a little odd. I think all of us as human beings inherently want to experience a range of states of consciousness. Otherwise, we wouldn't fall asleep and dream. Um, the other thing, I heard a very consistent theme about uh, people developing an opiate use disorder from a legitimate prescription during a medical procedure. Uh, I kind of want to draw attention to some data that wasn't um, reflected. I don't want to deny anybody's experience, but that tends to be the exception and not the, and not the norm. Uh, most people who get prescribed opiates for chronic pain do not become uh, addicted. But again, that's not to deny anybody's experience who spoke today. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that as, as healthcare providers, as scientists, as advocates, as individuals and families, I would love if we could all agree that the criminal justice component of this uh, issue needs to be removed completely. Uh, if I drive under the influence of a substance and a, a policeman pulls me over, I deserve to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. But if I'm, quote, exhibiting drug-seeking behavior, sorry, I'm exhibiting the characteristic of a person with an opiate use disorder. I would prefer if I can walk into a hospital and get a measured dose of oxycodone than I could have a, a fentanyl-soaked bag of shit that I had to get from my dealer in Brooklyn every other day. Um, so this is just a plug to end the drug war. Vote for reform-oriented district attorneys. If any sheriffs refuse to equip their officers with Narcan, vote them out of office. Uh, this is not a moral failing. Uh, it's a learning disorder. We could catch it early with people, with young people that are exhibiting uh, effects of trauma, uh, effects lacking resources and family support. We could intervene on these people early enough that we could perhaps save them from this affliction. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Now we have um, Juliana Mulligan. Hi. Um, I just want to first say that um, I don't want to disqualify anybody's personal experience through my own opinion. I believe that there's a million, more than a million different paths um, toward recovery or whatever you want to call it, and different things work for different people. But in my personal experience, I found use of the disease concept, the disease concept of addiction very unhelpful. Um, I do not believe that it is a disease. It actually does not fit the definition of a disease. It's not a science-based definition. And um, I stopped using opiates six and a half years ago with Ibogaine. I don't consider myself an addict. I do not have a disease, and I don't consider myself powerless. Um, I feel that the disease concept of addiction eliminates possibility for the exploration of the many unique um, experiences, emotional conditions um, that every person has. It's like a blanket statement saying you have a disease, and it does not leave room for investigating the many different um, diverse paths that lead a person to abuse substances. Um, so I would just like to advocate for a uh, transition away from that concept and the embracing of um, the fact that 
everybody suffers in some way. The fact that I chose to deal with it with a substance doesn't make me different from a person that chooses to deal with it through shopping or through television or through gambling. We all suffer in different ways and find different ways to deal with it. For some reason, substance users have been designated as this other population. Why is it that when you use a substance to deal with a difficult and emotional situation, that's difficult, that's different than dealing with a difficult emotional situation in a socially acceptable way? I think that that's bullshit. Um, I also just want to go on to say that since using Ibogaine six and a half years ago, I do not have opiate cravings. I am not at risk for relapse. That is not even a possibility on my horizon. After doing Ibogaine, I stepped out of that life and I am no longer in the realm of risk and I do not consider myself um, at risk for any of these things that we have been talking about. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen to anyone that uses Ibogaine, but the fact that that's happened for me and this person that called in and many other people that I have helped treat with Ibogaine, that is significant. It is a huge deal that this is the only drug that, that gets rid of that attenuates opioid. Thank you, Julie. Any, any I have final one thing thoughts? To say. I just, if we really want to talk about helping people, we need to talk about total decriminalization of drugs because that is the one thing that would immediately save thousands, if not millions, of lives right now. Thank you, Juliana. Um, our next speaker is Shiloh Jama. Hi. Um, I have a little list. I'm sorry, I'm a 42-year-old lifelong drug user um, who I'm the founder of the Urban Survivors Union, and I don't get a lot of chance to talk to the FDA. So um, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, naloxone. Um, you keep, you've just, re um, recently you just let a auto injector through that's $1,000. Um, we're just trying to get Narcan in people's hands. It's unhelpful to keep reinventing the real, w reinventing the wheel to make uh, drugs more costly than it is than just getting um, more generics out there for um, like liquid based or injectable uh, naloxone. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is with Medicaid assisted treatment, for opiates, we have nothing for stimulants. We don't have anything for um, methamphetamine. We don't have anything for cocaine. And on the West Coast, more people use stimulants than use opiates. Um, and we still have no plan for treatment um, for them. The only thing that I've ever seen is people prescribing antidepressants um, a month before they're considering um, um, stopping, which is very unhelpful and hard to um, gauge. The other thing is it's really important that we get better control and quality for Kratom and we do not make it illegal and we do not make it hard to get people. Um, thousands of people are being forced to use Kratom because we've made methadone clinics so inaccessible. We've made Suboxone clinics so inaccessible. Um, to, to be perfectly honest, I think the DEA does more harm to getting um, treatment in people's hands than it does helping them. Um, I also think stigma. I think we really need to get away from this idea of uh, uh, bad drug users, good drug users, um, because to be perfectly honest, um, I've used illegal drugs my whole life, and the only drug that has been the most detrimental to my body has been sugar, and it's the only one that people have always commented. That's why I have a round belly. Um, and, uh, thank, and, and so, thank you, um, Shiloh. Any any final comments? Um, final thoughts? Yes, I think it's really important that we start doing more research for uh, uh, ibogaine. I think it's very successful, and we've seen large amounts of success in Seattle using it. And um, I think we, and also we need to do more research for methamphetamine in general. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn over to our next speaker, Reginald Thomas. Also, in terms of timing, I just want to do a quick time check, let everyone know we're getting close to the 345 mark. So if you need to be on one of those buses, we, we don't mind if you have to step out. Thank you very much. I don't. I'm aware of this meeting being to develop something for opioids, but uh, sorry. But as, a, but as a drug user myself, not even as an opioid drug user, I recognize the end point should be the goal, right? I'm from the, I'm from the other Washington. While opioid use there is, uh, as it is throughout the nation, again, the endpoint focus should be shifted so, so the criminalization of it is removed. If I wanted to use whatever drug, decriminalizing and making available alternative medication to manage any, you know, anyone's drug use with the endpoint being happier, healthier drug use if used, Try that as the endpoint of, of patient-focused drug development. Thank you. 
Thank you, Reginald. Now we have Alice Bell. Alice Bell? Okay. Next we have Denise Mariano. Denise Mariano, she's still? Okay. So I had an opportunity um, to interact this morning, and I thank you for that, so I'll make it real brief. Um, I think I was able to talk about the family caregiver piece a lot. Um, there, there's many of us millions out here, so I want to preface this saying it's not about me, but what the landscape looks like for millions of us is um, um, finding out your, your child is sick and having no support systems, um, being denied treatment for two, three years with insurance, with private insurance, with employer insurance, and having no um, real good resources that empower that um, parent to be part of that recovery or wellness toolkit. And, um, and oftentimes, um, you know, just financial room. Um, my sense in recovery, and um, I, I think of all the above, and, and I know that I'm one of the lucky ones, but I know that the um, 30 emails I get today from the, on social media, I know that the hundreds of calls we get at the partnership for peer supports, um, there's a lot of people that look just like me still on this journey. Um, so part of it, when we were discussing things today, I think of the medication um, treatment side of it, right? So not where we just deny treatment, we're denied treatment medications. We're denied everything. So I, I think that's a real big hurdle for us, and I don't know what that looks like to help people that are denied. Um, um, the other thing is, is that I think um, that consumer-faced um, education is really important. Um, again, when you have lack of resources in education, to know that our son, you know, we paid $700 a week, and that's fine for Suboxone, but to know that he was giving him Xanax at the same time early on in the journey, I don't know that that's fatal. I'm just happy that maybe he's not craving. So that consumer-facing um, education is really important, especially for families. Um, and I also think... Um, what Carol said, just other means. So, so whether it's that app that supports you, that consumer face um, application, and really just not just the script, right? Because when we learned about medication assisted treatment, we heard a whole lot about continuum supports, right? And getting them healthy and well, and that individual recovery, mm -hmm. um, because it's so much more than substances. Um, so we don't see that. So a lot of questions were asked today, like, would you like that pill? Mm -hmm. I think we all would, but we would like the support system surrounding it as well. I think it's really important for that wellness piece of it. So thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um, next we have Megan Polanin. Megan Polanin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Megan Polanin from the National Center for Health Research. Our center analyzes scientific and medical data, promotes consumer-oriented health policy and legislation, and focuses on patient-centered research and treatment. We do not accept funding from industry, so I have no conflicts of interest to report. We thank the FDA and, and NIDA for convening today's meeting to elevate patients' stories. It's critical to know patients' perspectives on opioid use disorder, and this meeting is a positive step in initiating a productive dialogue. We know that the FDA has made a commitment to finding ways to reduce opioid use and addiction, including improving more treatments for opioid use disorder. We also know that drug companies are eager to get patients who want more treatments to talk with FDA officials. Kaiser Health News recently published their prescription for power database and reported that in 2015, pharmaceutical companies gave at least $116 million to patient advocacy groups. We want the FDA to hear from patients and are concerned that they're not hearing perspectives that represent the wide range of patients and their loved ones affected by opioid use disorder. Patients who aren't involved with these pharma-funded patient groups may not know how to engage with the FDA. If they know about public meetings like this one, they may not have the means to attend, and many don't know about opportunities to send written public comments to the FDA docket. Patients often ask us if it's worth their time and expense to come to an FDA meeting when they're given only a few minutes to speak and can only register to speak the morning of the meeting. We've heard from patients that they don't want to come to the FDA meeting at their own expense without a guarantee that they will have a chance to speak and be heard. Thank you. Any final thoughts? Um, yes. Yeah, so, so to ensure that the patient perspective is well represented, the patient engagement process should be inclusive and transparent, and we would encourage the FDA 
um, to continue to do so and make even more efforts. So thank you to the patients who've shared their stories today and we appreciate the opportunity to express our views. Thank you. I'll now be turning it over to one of my colleagues for some closing remarks. And also just for a time check, it's 3.53 if you are um, taking one of the shuttles back. Um, we just wanted to briefly take this opportunity to thank all of you for those who came. Uh, some came long distances and anyone who joined us virtually. Um, you shared your stories. We have listened and we have learned a great deal. So we are grateful for it. Uh, I also wanted to thank all the individuals who were involved in the planning. Uh, the panelists from FD at NIDA, Office of Center Director, Control Substance Staff and PACE, Office of Communications, Office of Media Affairs, Office of Minority Health, Office of New Drugs, um, Division of Anesthesia, Anesthesia and Addiction Products and Clinical Outcomes Assessment Staff, Office of Strategic Programs, Senior FDA Leadership, and our NDA, NIDA colleagues and advocacy and support groups. Uh, I really wanted to just really end it by saying thank you, a big thank you. Um, and also just uh, to mention that opioid use disorder is a chronic illness. It is treatable. There is evidence-based treatment. Um, and um, I just wanted to give the, there was a lot of discussions about trauma, uh, mental illness uh, um, and addiction, there is treatment available. The SAMHSA treatment locator is one good place to go to find a treatment that is close to you. And I also wanted to give the number for the suicide prevention hotline, 1-800-273-8255. So thank you so much and safe trip back home. Conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.